morning, family. Good morning. It is so great to be with you. If you want, or even if you don't want, open up your Bibles to John 7. We're going to be in John chapter 7, uh, in verse 32 through 36. We're going to get through chapter 7. I, I think we're spending probably like six messages in chapter 7. There's a lot of things in chapter 7 that I really, really wanted to point out and go over. But first thing I want to say I'm so grateful, and I have to start remembering to say one of your pastors, because now we have Xavier uh, on our staff, and then we also have Josh coming in the first part of July, so he'll be here. So, But I am so thankful for being one of your pastors. It's Last week, I had the opportunity to be able to go and, and share at a different church here in the Verde Valley, and, and, and it was great. I had a great time. The people were super amazing. They were great. But you know what? They weren't my family. Like, you guys are my family. And so it is such an honor and a joy to be with you guys. Um, they were my family in Christ. But they were like cousins. <laughs> where you guys are like immediate family. So I, I thank you for that. It's such a joy, such an honor to be serving the Lord alongside of you. I, I want to talk a little bit about the purse auction. Um, some people were asking me, why did I model yesterday? Or did I model? No, I did not. Um, <laughs> which that's why they made money. Um, but one of the things I saw at the purse auction, it was, it was great. There was women there that, that don't regularly attend our church. And, and uh, so it was, it was great to meet them. And they were kind of shocked that I was actually the pastor. But anyways, it was, what, what was neat was watching Mary and Noah, who you guys, need, give them a hand. They... they, they they are amazing. They have this thing so well put together and so well organized. But what was really, really cool, it was, again, it was a bunch of purses set up, and it was like, all right, Lord, help me with this woman thing, you know. But it, it, was, it was really, really cool. And what was amazing, though, was obviously the fellowship and the hanging out and the getting to know these women. But Mary actually presented even the gospel at it. And she, she had somebody who was modeling come out, and, and on their clothes, they had, like, fear and anxiety, and there were things labeled on her clothes. And, and, and she said, you know, some of you could be walking around with these same things. You're clothed in fear and anxiety and doubt and worry. She says, but no, clothe yourself in Christ. And it was so awesome to see that. So thank you, guys. You guys did an amazing job. And thank all of you that supported it. Um, it again, it was double from last year. So God is working. Amen? Amen. Yeah, and, and I'm so, so excited to be a part of what God is doing here. Last week in chapter 7, uh, Pastor Jim did a message on who is Jesus. And I think that is going to be, for all of us, the most important, mo most pivotal question that we'll ever answer. It's not what are we doing after today to go to lunch, or who am I going to marry, or which are very important things. I mean, I don't know how many of you have le left church and then get into it, we'll just say a discussion with your spouse on where you're going to go to lunch, right? And the next thing you know, you're at home eating peanut butter and jelly because nobody can decide. But Here's the thing, it's who is Jesus is the most important question you will ever answer. And in our text last week, we see that some of them believed, or it says many of them believed in verse 31. And I want you to be thinking about that as I pray for our message today. Please join me. Father, I thank you for the privilege and the honor to be able to share your word with your people. Father, speak to us. May our hearts be open. May our hearts be soft. Lord, I know there are many people here that have read through this text a lot. But Lord, I thank you that your word is active. It's alive. So Father, show us who you are. And then Lord, show us how to respond in a way that brings you honor and glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. So, let's read it. John 7, starting at verse 32. The Pharisees heard the crowd muttering these things about him. And the chief priests and Pharisees sent officers to arrest him. 
Jesus then said, I will be with you a little longer, and then I am going to him who sent me. You will seek me, and you will not find me. Where I am, you cannot come. The Jews said to one another, where does this man intend to go that we will not find him? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? Verse 36, what does he mean by saying, you will seek me and you will not find me, and where I am, you cannot come? In our lives, every day, we're filled with opportunity to make decisions or to respond to something. Every day, it doesn't matter. Pastor Jim said something last week to the fact that every time we're confronted with Jesus or a truth, there's a decision to be made. And I want to say there's a response that needs to happen as well. Every day, we're faced with multiple ways to respond to something. Something I usually talk to married couples about is I say, either when, depending on when you're having a discussion, you have the opportunity, with the way you respond, are you going to throw gasoline on a fire or are you going to throw water on the fire? And a lot of times it's in the way you respond or how you respond. And this thinking of this, it made me think of a story where a man is, his wife is off shopping. He gets a text from her and he looks at his phone and in the text message, she's standing in a dressing room with this new outfit on. She sends him a picture of the outfit, and then she asks the all-important question, right? You guys know what that is. Does this outfit make me look fat, right? <laughs> so if you're married, if you've ever answered that question, I say you respond immediately. So this man pulls out his phone, restarts typing in, he types in the letters, N, O, O, with all these exclamation points. Before he hit send, his phone autocorrected to move. <laughs> Can you imagine that? <laughs> How you respond and what you respond is what? Critically important. It is so, so important. I, I'm not telling you the rest of the story because it doesn't end well. But... <laughs> Something about an ambulance, emergency room, all that. But how and when we respond is so critically important. We see the crowd, okay? We see the Pharisees. We see the religious leaders. And, and they're all fired up because why Jesus is presenting truth. And many people are coming to him and following him. And they start walking around. They're cruising around the crowd, okay? And they hear these things. Now they have an opportunity to respond. They have an opportunity, their face now, with what are we going to do when we hear these things? And you know the story. I just read the verse, but look at verse 32 again. The Pharisees heard the crowd muttering these things. What are these things? These things that are that Jesus is the Christ, that he is the Son of God. They hear him, the crowd murmuring these things or muttering these things. And the chief priests and the Pharisees, first of all, those guys a lot of times don't even get along. Here they are, they're both meant and both well-schooled in God and the scriptures, but they don't even get along. But now they're joining hands together. Why? Listen to what it says. The chief priests and the Pharisees, what? Sent officers to arrest him. They have an opportunity to respond. They're walking around the crowd. They hear something, and what do they do? They respond with jealousy. They respond with hatred. They say, there is no way this guy can come and change our traditions. There's no way. So either we're going to receive it or we're going to reject it. And that same thing is true for us today. Either we're going to proclaim it the truth about who Jesus is, or we're going to try and silence it. And that happens in our culture today, doesn't it? There's people out there that are professing to be Christians and proclaiming the love and the grace of God. And then there's people out in our culture that are trying to silence that. They don't agree with it. They're trying to squash it. Here, 
we see, again, the religious leaders, the people that thought they had it all figured out, they're trying to silence Jesus. They're trying to silence him out of jealousy or out of hatred, but they're also trying to silence him because he's becoming more popular than they are. People are starting to follow them, him excuse me, more than they're following them. Here's the thing. As your pastor, I've been very upfront, very uh, transparent with you. I have maybe a slight, slight issue with competitiveness. <laughs> slight. Yeah, some, yeah, some. Anyways, I admit it. I'm, I'm being honest. And sometimes when I look at another church, or, or I look, and, I, and praise God, God is doing amazing things here. Now, that's why I'm, I'm being serious. Like, I love being your pastor here, your, your lead pastor. But I can have a tendency to say, oh, well, look at that. Like, wow, that's huge. And I can get what? Jealous. I can get angry. I can get, well, why, God, why is that happening there and not here? But God is working here, and that's awesome, and I want, I want you to hear that. But as people, that's what the religious leaders were doing. God, why is Jesus so popular when we've been here forever? And we've been by these people. And why now are they going to him instead of to us? Just this, uh, just this week, I had the opportunity to do that. Just this week, and I, I chose to do what? Praise that person that God is working through. I had a responsibility, I had an opportunity to respond with jealousy or hatred, but I said, and it must have been the Lord, trust me, I said, that person is doing an amazing job, praise God with them. Let's keep, see, we either have a chance to sling mud or to lift somebody up and praise somebody. The, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, this is God in the flesh walking among them, and what do they do? They want to silence him. Whereas you look in the contrast of the book that we've been studying, John the baptizer, what does he do the first time he sees Jesus? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And what did he do? Pointed everybody to Jesus. Should we be doing the same thing? Should we put down the jealousy Put aside the slinging of mud. Even if somebody's doing good, sometimes we find that little thing of, well, you know, they really, they part crooked. I don't know. I can't figure, find out something else, but they part crooked. I watched them park. They're a horrible parker. Whatever it is, you know what I'm saying? Like we sling mud, and it can have no relevance on what is really going on. I, I experienced this like crazy one time. I was, I used to, as a youth pastor, I used to take my youth group to an event called Acquire the Fire, okay? And uh, I was telling Xavier about it this week, and, and, and I actually even uh, dyed flames in the back of my hair one year when we went. It was awesome. <laughs> Seriously, I'm telling you. But anyways, my, my kids were utterly embarrassed, and my wife was like, oh, that's my husband. But anyways... We went to this event, and it's thousands of youth, and it's held in um, the uh, Arco Center, which is where the, the Sacramento Kings play their basketball game. So it's held in this, in this arena, and there's thousands of youth that are just on fire, praising the Lord, and it's so cool to be a part of it. Well, they sent us out for lunch. We go out for lunch, and everybody either goes somewhere, they, they bring picnic, and they're hanging out on the, on the grounds, and... We're going back into the event, and there's people that have set up a little table there. And they don't agree with some of the things that are going on in the arena. Um, I don't have a problem with that. What I had a problem with was all the people that were an hour ago praising and lifting up the name of Jesus and you know, just with tears and so excited, we're now yelling and screaming at the people that were just trying to have a conversation. They were grabbing their information. They had pamphlets. 
They were grabbing their pamphlets and yelling and screaming and then throwing their pamphlets down. I was so embarrassed to be part of the crowd going back into the arena. And I think we need to, again, put that aside. Does there truth that needs to be shared? Amen. Yes, there is. But how we do it and when we do it is critically important. And these people that were yelling at the face of somebody that was supposed to be on this, in the same family, in the same family, and they're yelling at them. And that's the religious leaders. You're trying to change my tradition. You're trying to do something different than I like or that I know. And so let's silence him. Well, let's look how Jesus responds, because now Jesus has an opportunity to respond. Look at verse 33. Then Jesus said, I will be with you a little longer, and then I am going to him who sent me. Who is he talking to right here? He's talking to a crowd of many that could be believing, but he's also talking to the people sent to arrest him and the religious leaders who want him arrested. And he brings truth. Jesus responds with truth. He doesn't get up and start yelling of how can you be accusing me of this or that or the other thing. He simply says something, and I think we can read over it, and we don't let it hit home. And so I, I, that's why I'm taking this section very slow. It says, I will be with you a little longer. Two things I want to point out with just that phrase. One is they sent somebody to arrest Jesus, right, to silence him, to mute his voice. He's telling them, and Pastor Jim hit on this a little bit last week. He's telling them, I don't care about your agenda or your time frame to try to silence me. My father's time frame will not be altered. My father's time, I'm going to be here a little while longer. You can get all fired up and start yelling at me and trying to arrest me. But the truth is, I'm going to be here a little bit. And do you know how much that little bit was? Six months. From the time he said this to the time of his death and resurrection was six months. That's it. He said, so you can think, I need to alter the plan. I need to silence this guy. No, it's all God's plan. Amen. It's not their plan. It's God's. And he, they can't alter it. But another thing that I think is super, super important that we recognize, he says, I will be with you. Listen to this. We, we have been talking about, I want to come down here. <laughs> Why? Because I want to be with you. I want you to think about this. This is truth. This, when we look at what we've seen so far in the Gospel of John, we see, especially in chapter 1, we see what? The Word was with God, the Word was God, and the Word became flesh, and what? And dwelt among them. He moved into their neighborhood. He was saying, here I am, God in your flesh. And they were so caught up in their jealousy, their hatred, their changing of their tradition, that they looked at God in the flesh that was with them, and he, they said, let's arrest him. Let's silence him. There is not no point. They can't do it. But I don't want to get into that discussion right now. But that is the truth. They, they, they were so wrapped up in their emotions that they were not thinking logically. They were not understanding what he was saying. Even in this text we see, they did not understand what he's saying. He did not say, I'm going somewhere, but I'm not telling you where I'm going. He told them right where he's going, but yet they're confused. Listen to what he says in verse 34. You will seek me and you will not find me. Why? Because he says, I'm going, back up in 33, sorry. And then I am going to him who what? Sent me. I'm going back to the Father. He wasn't playing a game of hide and seek. He was saying, I'm telling you where I'm going to go, but I'm also telling you 
you can't come. Man, think about that. You ever been told as a little child when everybody else is going to go do something super fun and you're all excited about it, I can't wait, I get to go. And they say, no, you're too little, you can't come. Never as a kid, or everybody else is going to play this game, or they're going to ride this ride at the fair, but you're too short. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? That, that's disheartening, isn't it? Jesus is looking at this crowd, and he says, I'm, not, I'm going to tell you where I'm going. It's not a game of hide and seek. And it made me think about when I play hide and seek with my grandkids, it's so fun because I'll, they'll say, okay, Papa, I'm going to go hide, you try and seek me. And so then I count, you know, I cover my eyes, they go hide, and then I'll say, oh, I wonder where Grace is when they were little, and what do I hear? <laughs> oh, I wonder, did Grace go in the other room? And then you walk that way, oh, <laughs> so I start laughing. You see the curtains start moving because they can't sit still. It's like that. Jesus says, I'm telling you where I'm going. I'm going to be with my father. I'm not hide and seek from you, but you're not going to be able to go, and you're not going to be able to see me. Here is your opportunity to respond to me in the flesh, but it's only six more months. That's it. Now, praise God, we can still respond to him now, amen? But he's also, we can't forget that he was with them. He was with them. In the flesh. And sometimes we face things on this side of eternity and we ask ourselves, God, where are you? I'm telling you, he's with you. He's with you. There is nothing that you face as a believer in Jesus Christ that God is not with you. Just this morning, we had the opportunity to pray with two of our family members who are facing some challenging surgeries. And that's the thing we prayed, that they would know that God is with them. You need to know today that God is with you. Maybe that's all you came for today was to know that God is with you. He might not be in the flesh, but yet we have the Holy Spirit that dwells and lives within us. Amen? And that is God with us. So no matter what we face, no matter how when we respond, and we respond inaccurately, or we respond with jealousy and hate and anger, I pray that the Holy Spirit would convict us and that we would make it right and then respond with God's love and God's grace. Here's another question I have as I was reading through this. I'm thinking, how much time am I spending in the presence of God? Because tell, trust me, we might say, yeah, I go to church and I feel God's presence here and I feel God's presence here, but one time a week is not enough. I, that's why we introduced the reading plan. Get in God's word. Some of you are like, well, you know, I really like the one-year Bible reading plan. And some people are like, well, I like the chronological, or I like this, or I like that. Great, do it. But get in God's word. And the reason I picked a two-year plan, because, I'm going to be honest with you, when I used to do the one-year plan, I would read, and you had to read so much that I would read through it, I would get up, and I would forget almost everything I just read. But now that we're reading it slower, and we're trying to even soap, for those that are soaping with it, be in God's presence. God's word is meant to display who God is. And when I get into his word, I get to know my father. So get into God's word every day. See the character and the, the love, the grace, the holiness we sang about how he's holy. Get into God's word and you will know him. What's crazy, too, is he says, you will seek me, now in context, you will seek me and you will not find me to these people. When Jesus was resurrected, who saw him? 
those that loved him and sought him with a pure heart. Not the religious leaders. They all wondered where to go, which was true. They were like, I guess we can't find him because he's gone. But who found him and a lot of people saw him were those that sought him with their heart. Who sees him today? Those that seek him with their heart, with a heart of understanding of who you are, not a heart to say, I don't, I want to silence you. I don't want you. Those are the people, unfortunately, sometimes that don't see him. But here, he's telling the people, you won't see me. But later he appears, and he appears to those that do love him, that do seek him. There's something else that I thought was very interesting in this text. And the crowd quoted Jesus word for word, did they not? They listened to him, and they quoted it. But they still recognized what? They couldn't go. How many of us have heard people or know people that can quote God's word, but then you look at their life and their actions and they're like, they're far from God. Just because we sit here in church doesn't mean we're going there. Just because we can say a couple Bible verses doesn't mean we're, that's our ticket in. We need to know him. We need to know him. So Jesus, his point his main point in what he's talking about right now is, now is the time to respond. Now is the time to respond to me in the flesh. I praise God that we that have not seen Jesus in the fresh flesh, excuse me, we have the opportunity to respond as well. But he's telling this crowd in context, I'm going to be here six more months. Now is your time to see me in the flesh and to respond. There comes a time... And an opportunity when we miss it that we don't get to relive it. These people will never relive, obviously, this. I, and it makes me think of this story. A few years ago when I was a painting contractor, um, there was a, a paint rep from a certain uh, paint company that um, wanted to steal me from the, the company that I was buying all of my paint from. He would call me all the time, and Richard, I can do the same thing they're doing. I can give you this price, and that material matches their material, and all this kind of stuff. And, but I really, really liked this other paint store, and, and, and it was great. They, they gave me a ton of work, so I was committed and loyal to this other team, or excuse me, this other company. And then this paint rep calls me one day, and he says, Richard, he goes, would you want to go with me? to the Trailblazers, because we live in the Pacific Northwest, the Trailblazers are hosting a playoff game. I have tickets. Would you like to go? And I was thinking to myself, let me call you back. I'll see what's on my calendar. And I just wanted to pause because I'm like, I really don't want to go hang out with you. I'm just being real, okay? And I was like, I don't know if I want to go, but I have this one opportunity. And if I don't go, I don't get to relive it again. That's it. And so I told the guy, no, no, thank you. I don't want to be, you know, I didn't say I want to hang out with you. I said, no, thank you. I just don't want to go, what have you. So about the third quarter of the game, I turned on the TV. No, excuse me, fourth quarter. Seven minutes left in the game. That was 10, but this is seven. Seven minutes left in the game. Portland was down by 15 points. So I'm like, well, see, it's a good thing I didn't go. I, I, not, I was not a Portland Trailblazers fan, but I'm like, you go to your home, your home team, you root for your home team or whatever. So, but I'm like, oh, it's a good thing I, I didn't go. And then this happened. Watch, watch this. Is off. Is off. Portland has a timeout. Lillard, a chance to send the Thunder home. Lillard, long range three. And it's good! At the buzzer, Damian Lillard, are you kidding me? Hey, this playoff games. I had the opportunity to go. And that guy, almost from half court, Damian Lillard was his name, hit that shot to win the series for Portland. And I'm sitting there thinking, I just missed out on a huge opportunity. I didn't respond well when I got this invitation. 
Next week, come back. Because there's going to be an invitation in the message. An invitation for Jesus. And how you respond to that is critical. Not only, yes, if you've never responded to Jesus Christ, yes, it's very critical. But even if you have, even today, if you said, yes, I put my faith and my trust in Jesus Christ, do we recognize that we, every second, we get closer to the second coming? Do we recognize that? People get all fired up. Richard, when do you think Jesus is coming back? It, you know, and they, they, they look at all these things in the world, and they're like, Richard, Richard, what do you think? And I say, calm down. Breathe. I say, I try to live every moment like he's coming back the next moment. I'm not getting fired up about when I'm watching this. Now, is there interesting things? Yes, there's interesting things, which tells us what? It's getting closer. I know that we're closer to the return of Christ now than we were when I started this message. <laughs> we're closer, right? We're getting closer. So now is the opportunity for us to share the love of Jesus with those that don't know. See, Jesus was giving them an opportunity to respond. He gave the crowd the opportunity to respond. Many believed the religious leader said, we're going to respond with jealousy and hatred and try to silence you. Jesus responded with truth, and he laid it down, but he laid it down with grace, saying, I'm going to be here, but I'm only going to be here a little bit longer. And where I'm going, you're not going to come if your heart stays like this. That's the thing. Now we have the opportunity to do the same thing with our loved ones, with the people that we know that don't know the Lord, with the people that we interact with in bashes, in Walmart, in, I don't care, Taco Hell, Taco Bell. <laughs> we have the opportunity to respond to these people with God's love and God's grace. And will we do that? Will we do that? Will we continue to be that church that responds in God's love? Let's pray. Father, I thank you again for your amazing love. I thank you for your word. And Lord, I pray that you would continue to speak to us. Lord, as we continue to seek you and trust you, that Lord that we won't get fired up about the traditions or popularity and miss what you're doing. Miss how you're standing and moving in our midst of how you're doing what you're doing here today. Lord, I pray that we would respond with truth and grace. That, Lord, that we, as your children, who claim to follow and to serve, that we would do that, that we would follow and that we would serve in whatever you're asking us and however you're asking. Father, I pray that you would be glorified by our responses. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand and close our service to the song.
God bless. Have a wonderful, wonderful week. You are dismissed. We can't wait to see you next week.